The Bitcoin is actually going to be the secondary product that we get from mining. What we want is the heat. If you talk about Bitcoin as a money, you hit brick walls because that's threatening. If you talk about Bitcoin as an, a solution to energy problems, you find open doors. If you bring electricity to a community, they blossom, they flourish. You, without electricity, you're dead. So we've lived in China, we've lived in Africa, we've lived in the Middle East. I know how the other half lives. I know how privileged we are in Europe. It's the system that, that's broken. Yes. Over time, the Bitcoin flows to those people who produce the goods and services that you need. Whereas what we have at the moment is the pounds and the euros and the dollars flow towards those people who already have the pounds, dollars and euros. If I've got property, I can borrow money at zero interest or next to no interest. I can buy more property, not because I've produced anything that's good for society, but just that I happen to be rich in the first place. Satoshi Nakamoto is a man. This is somebody who could be very focused, who's worked and worked and worked and worked. This is what men do really, really well. They, they get a problem and they can solve that problem. Thank God for the men in our lives. When it comes to Bitcoin adoption, this is where I think we need the women. Then hi, Rachel, how are you doing? Everything fine on your end? Yeah, everything's good here. I've just had the luxury of a nice six-week break. Um, it's been a very, very hectic two years, and my body was screaming, stop. And I work for the best company in the world, and they just said, Rachel, take your time, take what you need. And now I've just come back. My first day of work was on Monday, full of energy and full of optimism and ready to do the next stage of this incredible journey. Really, really cool. And with the company, you mean TerraHash? I mean TerraHash. And it was so nice because it was my colleagues who came to me and said, look, Rachel, what do you need? And they could say, I went to Prague and I, Prague was fantastic. And I was exhausted after Prague. And then I just found it really difficult. You know, it's been, I've been doing this now for, for two years and every day is exciting. Every day is new. Every day there's big news. There's something, there's something going on and I'm not complaining It's wonderful and it's exactly what we want to have for Bitcoin. Um, but I'm no longer the youngest uh, in the Bitcoin scene. And uh, yeah, uh, women of a certain age, uh, you have your, your certain problems. And my body was just saying, hey, take a break. And I have learned in my life, it's always important to listen to your body. Health first. And so, yeah, I'm now back with renewed vigor to do the next stage. Re really, really cool, yeah. And I think TerraHash is a, a topic we really never discuss it on the podcast, even though it has been like 250 episodes or more like that. Um, maybe as a beginning question, what challenges do we face in the energy sector and how will Bitcoin help to resolve that and Bitcoin help to uh, actually enhance those, those things? Well, we all know, I mean, you just need to look at your electricity bill to see what problems do we have <laughs> in the energy sector. And this is exactly how TerraHash was born, to be honest. So TerraHash is part of a, of a group of companies, uh, a typical German mid-sized company family run. And we produce car parts, we produce cosmetics, uh, we produce uh, plastics, spraying technology, and everything needs an awful lot of energy. And we were suffering from the high price of energy. So the, the founder, Chris Klager, thought, well, you know what? You know, he just discovered Bitcoin and he just discovered what Bitcoin mining can do. Maybe I can use Bitcoin mining, you know, if I, if I put a few miners down in my cellar and I can use the heat that comes from the Bitcoin mining for my production. And this is exactly what he did. So, so it was all set up down in the cellar. And then you think, well, wait a minute, if this is a solution for our company, how many other companies are out there who are also looking for uh, a solution who want to become uh, more self-sufficient, not so dependent on the fluctuation of the energy prices? So we all know from the energy prices that uh, we do have a problem with, with energy in Europe. We also know that Europe is trying to become more and more renewable. And renewable energy, although it's fantastic, has a problem that it's intermittent. You know, when is the sun going to shine? When is the wind going to blow? And the grid needs to be kept at a very stable 50 hertz. And that's a very easy thing to do when you have a gas-fired gas power station or a coal-fired fired power station. Gosh, that's a tongue twister. Um, but when you've got wind and sun coming 
at, at different times. And then you have the demand. You know, normally you talk about this duck curve of demand. So you have a very high demand in the morning and then around midday it, it, it gets less. And then up to the evening it, it gets more again as the households are needing their electricity. And that's exactly the opposite of when you have solar. You know, solar, the middle of the day is when you have your most solar. So how do the grid, how does the grid operator manage to keep the grid stable? And this is a massive problem. So what they're doing at the moment is they are paying, or when I say they, it always ends up with the taxpayer, uh, paying the solar farms, paying the wind farms to curtail their energy, which is a complete waste. We should not be con- curtailing and throwing away energy. And therein lies the beauty of Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin mining is is a customer who needs enormous quantities of energy, but it has to be at the right price because you're competing on a global market. Uh, But it's very flexible because, I mean, let's just to clarify, Bitcoin mining is nothing more than a data center. It's nothing more than computers. And uh, so because there's no final customer, if you have a data center, which is um, an AI data center or a Google data center or a Netflix data center, there are customers on the other end who want constant service. So you can't just turn them on and off. With Bitcoin, there's no customer. And so they will they will take as much energy as they can get if the price is reasonable. And the price is always reasonable when there's an, over demand, uh, an oversupply in the market. And then come the time when that uh, supply is needed for the households, for the businesses, the Bitcoin uh, uh, data centers can be turned off extremely quickly. Nobody suffers. And so it's a wonderful tool for grid providers, for grid grid operators to solve this problem of keeping the uh, grid stable. And I mean, we can go into this later. I don't want to hold a great big monologue here, but there's many different ways that we're looking into as to how Bitcoin energy can be a solution for a lot of the problems we have in Europe. Yeah, I, the, the first time I really heard about that was with Lisa Huff on the podcast where she was on uh, and she basically told me like, yeah, there are, like, there are energy uh, companies that pay other companies to take the energy from them because they have too much at certain times. And I'm like, <laughs> wouldn't it be so easy to just like plug in a, a Bitcoin miner there and, yeah. and mine Bitcoin with that because you pay for the energy to be stored somewhere else? Uh, and you could just like get paid to get the energy there. Like that, that, that seems like a no brainer, but it seems like there's something holding the industry back. Yeah. Uh, firstly, education. So if you look what the narrative has been about Bitcoin and about Bitcoin mining in particular, you know, we're going to be using all the energy by 2020 uh, was the message from the WEF. Um And you still see it. You know, there is this mistaken belief that the use of energy is a negative thing. And the use of energy is is life-giving. You know, there's no problem with using energy. You need to be careful. Where does the energy come from? What is the energy source? So we find that we have, you know, we spend an awful lot of our time with TerraHash um, educating companies on what Bitcoin mining really is. And this is where it's very useful. We have a research lab in our where the the people can come along and see Bitcoin mining in action. And I have to be honest, this was me as well. I, you know, when I first learned about Bitcoin, when I first understood Bitcoin, then I knew I had to work for Bitcoin uh, because I knew that it's something I want for myself and I want for my children and I want for the future. But of course, you've got this thing about um, Bitcoin energy, or is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So the very first thing I did was an internship at a Bitcoin mining company, unpaid for three months, to learn, you know, what what what's it all about. Uh, so so the education, you know, I walked then into Terahash into the into the lab, and you see, well, it's just computers, and it's quiet, and it's not dirty, you know, and you can see we have lots of media come and visit us, we have politicians come and visit us, and you can just see the light bulb go off and say, wait a minute. This isn't what I was expecting Bitcoin mining to be. I think mining is an unfortunate word that we've chosen to call it because mining, the connotation with mining is dirty. It's digging and it's, you know, destroying the earth. And and nobody questions data centers. There's never been a question about are data centers dirty? So, So first we have to change the narrative. 
but secondly, things are never as easy as, you know, it's never quite as plug and play as, as you hope it would be. And you have to remember with, uh, with Bitcoin, it's a global market. And so you are competing with uh, Saudi Arabia, where you can get electricity for two, two cents for a kilowatt. You're, you're, you're competing with the entire world on this. And that's where it's difficult for for Europe in particular, where the energy, the cost of energy is higher, to have an economic use case. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible. And I think this is going to be a massive advantage for Europe because we are forced to be innovative and we are forced to have integrated solutions to Bitcoin mining. And we need to use every single scrap of what comes out of Bitcoin mining. So I think we're going to find the Bitcoin is actually going to be the secondary uh, product that we get from mining. What we want is the heat. So we've just we're we're doing a fascinating project in Finland at the moment. We've got one megawatt of a power plant, one megawatt. We've put miners there. It's going online first of November. We're heating twelve thousand households with that. And so then, yeah, it's it's awesome. It's cool. And when you look at it, it's high tech. It, it's clean. It looks good. We're using hydropower. You know, it's good all the way around. And if we can get more of these projects up and running that people can see it and see it in action and say, hey, wait a minute, this is fantastic. And then, of course, if you're selling the heat, you you can become more economically viable with Bitcoin mining because you're getting a secondary income from the heat. Or you could get a secondary income from curtailing of the of the grid, or you get a secondary income from CO2 certificates, you know, so we have to be smarter. We have to, we have to work harder to get integrated systems. But I think in the long run, that is in the interest of Bitcoin, because it needs to be as decentralized as we can. And it has to have as much use for humanity as as it can. So I'm very excited about the prospect of Bitcoin mining in Europe. It's just going to take a little bit longer. Really, really cool. I want to get also later in this topic, Europe versus America. I think that's uh, it's a really interesting topic. But first I heard, and this just came up in my head, I heard, I think a few weeks ago, or even this week, about Norway, where they, in a certain city, they shut down a big uh, a Bitcoin miner facility. And now the electricity prices shot up, like, I think, I think 20% or something like that it yeah, was. The uh, that was an amazing example for me. I think they, they turned it off because of the noise. Um, is, is that one of the, the real world examples where like actual people in their households to get the news and they're like, oh, we turned off the Bitcoin mine and now we have to pay more for, for those energy prices? That seems to be a perfect example for that. Perfect. And the other thing that, that Terahash did uh, quite near the beginning is we set up an association called the European Bitcoin Energy Association, because we realized that we need to be spreading the news to European regulators. You know, there are regulations coming up. We need regulations. I mean, don't get me wrong on this. Um, Bitcoin mining has been, to a large extent, cowboy country particularly up in the Nordics, you know, you get your people going in there wanting to make quick profits and skedaddle. So as soon as the price uh, of electricity uh, gets too high or, or there are other things that are, maybe the, the regulations change, they've just left, leaving their hardware behind, leaving unpaid bills. You just need to look for exam examples of what's happening in Paraguay, what's happening in Ethiopia, uh, things that And this is what we want to do with Terahash. We want to have a very clean, regulated, legal, fiscally responsible, environmentally responsible solution. And so we we set up EBIA, uh, getting on board all the people we need to have on board. And, you know, if you want to be talking at the European level, you need to have people sitting at the table who are used to talking at the European level. So you have to be very careful who sits around the table. And we managed to get a fantastic board around. We have got Sven Hildebrandt, who works for Börse Stuttgart, who's very heavily involved in the MICA regulations. We've got Harold Rauter, who worked many years ago on the New Deal, the European New Deal. So he speaks the language, but he understands what Bitcoin mining is and the potentials of Bitcoin mining. We've got Mike Herrmann, 
who works for Tenet. That's one of the four big grid providers of, of Germany. And again, he's involved at the European level on energy regulations, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's several more on the team and, and we are growing that. And a lot of the work is going on behind doors. I mean, yesterday we had a conversation with the European Member of Parliament. Well, she's actually just been not elected for the second period. But this is what this is what we need to be doing quietly, quietly having those conversations behind closed doors and showing rather than telling. So that's a wonderful example in Norway. If you can go along and say, look, this is what's happened. Take the example of what Gridless is doing in Kenya. You know, the, the Bitcoin, the, the, the fact that Bitcoin miners are moving to the area and, and hydro plants are being built because of the Bitcoin mining because it's finally economically viable to build a plant, the locals are having electricity for the first time in their life. If you bring electricity to a community, they blossom, they flourish. You, without electricity, you're dead. You know? so, so we're slowly building up this portfolio. Another person who's sitting on the board of, of uh, EBIA is uh, Frederick Finker, who's the CEO of Prosperity Digital, another um, well, it's a data center. They, you know, they put up data centers. Also, very invested in, in or interested in Bitcoin mining, and coming with real life examples of this is where we're doing Bitcoin mining, and this is the advantage for the environment, for the society, and for the world at large. And that way, you can save hundreds of hours of talk, 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 because on paper it all looks good, but does it really work in the practice? So that's that's our main goal. Really interesting. How big of an impact do things like Bitcoin ETFs and BlackRock now on on the other side uh, of fighting for Bitcoin rather than against it, and those big players coming into the scene has for the regulations on Bitcoin mining? I think we were all a little bit surprised. Everything helps for sure. Uh, far more interesting for Bitcoin mining than the ETFs was, for example, an excellent report from KPMG about the, the advantages of, of Bitcoin mining. And there's more and more reports coming out from these well-established, well-reputed uh, companies. You know, Forbes has, has um, often, regularly, they have articles on, on Bitcoin mining. It all helps. Every little bit helps. We came to the conclusion quite early on, when we started Terahash two years ago, we weren't 100% sure which direction we were going. We knew, the company is actually called Terahash.energy GmbH. Yeah? So we did know that we would be an, an energy company. But we started off with these three um, pillars of energy, education, and events. And we learned very quickly, if you talk about Bitcoin as a money you hit brick walls because that's very threatening to to governments. To that's threatening. If you talk about Bitcoin as an a solution to energy problems, you find open doors. And so this is a wonderful strategy. So let's talk about Bitcoin as as an energy solution. We don't need to talk about Bitcoin as a money. I mean, if you think about it, everybody in Europe has access to to a bank account. As far you know, maybe there's one or two who don't, but you know, the vast majority of people have access to a bank account. It seemingly works. You know, once you study Bitcoin and you understand what money really is, you see where it's not working. But to uh, the man on the Clapham omnibus, you know, the, uh, they think money works, and so they don't think that there's a problem. And if you don't think that there's a problem, you're not interested in looking for a solution. And it's only when you, it's only when you feel the problem yourself that you're open to looking for a solution. And every citizen in, in Europe, particularly in Germany, feels the feels the heat, or that's doesn't feel the heat with with the problems with with electricity. So you find that people are are more interested to listen to it. I mean, this is something that I'm finding with Les Femmes en Orange, which is this organization that we started to get more women interested in Bitcoin. What I find fascinating is that the women who tend to understand Bitcoin the earliest are people of my age, because we know that we have a problem 
when it comes to pensions. You know, you've you might have taken years off to look after the children. You and and we know that the pensions that we're getting close to having to rely on are not going to be enough to sustain us or to sustain us in a way that we're used to living. And so those women have a problem and Bitcoin comes along as a solution to this problem. And you find that it's much easier to talk to these women about what the the benefits of Bitcoin. So once you've managed to establish the problem and the people recognize the problem and you're coming with a genuine solution, that makes the whole thing much easier. That surprised me the most when I started the podcast. Um, now I have quite a big range of audience, and now I see really like where where is the main cohort of the audience, uh, and it's basically forty five to fifty. That's like the main cohort of my audience, which is surprising because I'm just twenty five. And really surprising for me was uh, I have three times as many people over sixty five than under twenty five. Like that, that like. Um, I think you have to get to a certain age to actually understand what Bitcoin is actually solving because till 2025, 20, you, you probably, especially if you're living in Europe or Austria, Germany, like you don't have those those kind of problems and you have to you, you have lay the hat. You have the problems, but you don't know that you've got the problems. You know, yeah. they, live in, <laughs> they live in cloud cuckoo land and, and you only think about today and you don't think about tomorrow. I mean, when I was 25, I did not think about my pension. Um, and and so it's the problems are there for the young people, and this is why I'm doing it. This is why I do what I do. My most important job is I'm the mother of four children, and my children are all in the age you know between uh, 20, 21 and and twenty eight. And I can see the difference in the world that they're living in. They've got good jobs, most of them, <laughs> most of them, and yet and and their partners as well. Can they afford to get on the property ladder? No, they haven't got a hope in heck unless the parents put in some money, but that's not a sustainable solution. So even though they've got good jobs, they cannot afford to get on the property ladder. And if you can see no sense in saving, you spend. You know, So they'll go on holidays four times a year. They do f- fantastic things, but this is very short-term thinking. And, you know, the other reason why if I didn't have my children, I wouldn't be sitting here today. It was my son, um, Patrick, who's who was the Bitcoin of the family. And it was him who came to me in 2017 and said, "Mum, you need to look at this this new technology. I I basically ignored the guy for, for three years. And I'm so grateful for him. I mean, I did. We did buy a little bit of Bitcoin at the time, kind of. Yeah, okay, Patrick, buy a little bit for me and for my husband and buy a little bit for each child. And of course, we bought it at the peak in 2017 and it went from 17,000 down to 3,000. So I obviously thought it was a bit of rubbish. And the children also, it was their Christmas present and they also thought, well, well, that was a rubbish Christmas present. Uh, But Patrick doggedly kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on trying to educate us. And then in 2020, when the pandemic hit, And we suddenly all lost our jobs. We were living in Africa and we had to leave Africa. And I suddenly found myself with time on my hands. I started reading and I started researching. And then I had a light bulb moment when I read the book from Alex Gladstein, Check Your Financial Privilege. Because we've lived in many countries. We've lived in China. We've lived in Africa. We've lived in the Middle East. I know how the other half lives. I know how privileged we are in Europe. And when I read that book, and it was just... The system's broken. It's the system that, that's broken. It just was this light bulb moment for me. And I knew I had to stop everything that I was doing and work for Bitcoin for my children. Because I want my children to have a sustainable future and an optimistic and a hopeful future. And I see that very strongly. If, if you do not have a healthy money, you do not have a healthy society. And when we were living in South Africa, it's, you know, obviously we were the privileged expats, but you will find this compound of where you're living with your swimming pool and your gardener and your maid and a beautiful big house. And then outside your walls, which have got barbed wire and men with guns to protect you, you've got a shanty town. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. And the same thing is happening here. We are not quite at the same stage, as, uh, but we're getting there. 
we are getting there. I mean, just my daughter the other day, she she wrote in the family chat, my rent's just gone up by 9%. She lives in London. My rent's just gone up by 9%. The last three years, my rent went up 8% each year. My salary's gone up 2%. So slowly, 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 the you know the middle classes are getting poorer, 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 poorer. The riches, rich ones are getting richer. And this is disastrous for a society. You cannot have a society, a healthy society with such disparities where there's no way for the have-nots to become a have. And the beauty with Bitcoin is obviously at the beginning, it's going to be unfairly distributed. That's the nature of the beast. That's that's life. If you've understood what Bitcoin is before other people have understood it and you've invested in it, you're going to have an advantage if if what we believe happens is going to happen. But the beauty of Bitcoin is over time, the Bitcoin flows or the Satoshis flow to those people who produce the goods and services that you need. Whereas what we have at the moment is the pounds and the euros and the dollars flow towards those people who already have the pounds, shilling, uh, dollars and euros. If I've got property, I can borrow money at zero interest or next to no interest. I can buy more property, not because I've produced anything that's good for society, but just that I happen to be rich in the first place. And that is what Bitcoin is going to change. It's going to take a heck of a long time. This is not something that's going to happen in my lifetime. But at least you know you're on the proper trajectory that then everything in life is about energy and you want the energy to be flowing to those who who have earned it. And that's what Bitcoin is for me. Wow, that's 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 beautiful. There were a lot of interesting, um, <laughs> a lot of interesting topics in there. Uh, um, the, the first one I want to start is the power of orange pilling your own family. Uh, what Patrick did was was uh, really cool because he introduced it to the to the family, and I think that's what um, I also really am passionate about. Like first start with your loved ones when you want to orange pill, when you want to introduce Bitcoin to someone. Like with your family, that's probably the 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 highest return for yourself and and for your family to to to, to get across uh okay well you've hit on quite a raw point there Robin because our family is pretty split down the middle on this one so <laughs> so he hasn't managed to have as much success or or me as well and and you know you know what I came to the conclusion we've done it wrong we've done it wrong because missioneering never works. And so, you know, at the beginning when Patrick was, you know, hammering, 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 I had to ban him from the family chat or not ban him, but ban the topic of Bitcoin. So I said, listen, let's open a second chat. Let's have a, a, a family Bitcoin chat. And any family member who wants to take part can take part, but we can't force it. You know. So then it was interesting to see who did take part in this in this chat. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that some of us see Bitcoin as an investment. I don't see Bitcoin as an investment. Of course, it is. But for me, Bitcoin is far bigger than investment. And I think that with us being so evangelical about it, we've actually put off members of the family. And and that wasn't clever And I've come to the conclusion and helped along the way by some wonderful people that I've met in my life. Um, show, don't tell. So if people aren't open to a subject, of course you can talk about it. I mean, I've actually bought Bitcoin for some of my friends who I know desperately need it, but they don't have the money to buy. And I understand, you know, they, they can't speculate. They're living hand to mouth. And so if I go along to, to my friends and say, hey, come on, put 500 euros in this, they're going to say, are you mad? You know, I, I need to buy a new washing machine. Um, so they cannot afford to make a mistake. So even though we think that this is... a This is the safe bet. Keeping your money in euro is not the safe bet. I completely understand that they can't think like that. And so I think it's better to take a step back with the orange pilling. When people are ready to learn about it, they will come to you. And then, and then, and then it's easy. And so what you need to be doing is showing by the way that you live your life. 
So you decide for yourself that Bitcoin is the way that you want to go. And that is the life that I want to lead. And so I will make sure that I can pay my rent in in, in Bitcoin or I receive my rent in, 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 in Bitcoin and I live in, in a way that I think is sustainable. And then if people look at that and think, oh, I wonder what she's doing and why she's more relaxed about what's going on in the world uh, compared to us, that has a much bigger effect than trying to slam people into believing the same thing that you believe. And at the end of the day, Robin, none of us know the future. None of us know the future. And so is this what's going to happen? I don't know. I know that the current monetary system is dead and dying. It's it is dying. I mean, it's pure mathematics. <laughs> that debt pile of debt is going to keep growing. Whatever they do, the pile of debt is going to keep growing. And I mean, we lived in we lived in South Africa and went over to Zimbabwe and you've got lying on the floor, you've still got the trillion dollar Zimbabwe dollars. It's lying on the floor. It's toilet paper, you know. And I think people can't conceive that this could one day happen to to the euro, but it will. It will. I mean, we probably won't have any dollars lying on uh, euros lying on the floor because by then we'll all be on CBDCs and there'll be no uh, there'll be no cash cash to lie around. It's happening already. It's happening already. Just look at the price of houses. We know that it's happening. So one thing we can say for certain: the monetary system that we have now is not sustainable for our, for a healthy society. But what we cannot say for certain is. Is Bitcoin going to be the next thing? I believe it will, but we cannot. We do not know the future. If you watch my podcast already for more than two times, you know how extremely passionate I am about self-custody. And the first very, very, very important step to self-custody is always getting yourself a hardware wallet. And I have one for you here. This is the Bitcoin only edition from the Bitbox, my favorite single signature hardware wallet on the market. Another really important piece of self-custody if you have a hardware wallet is the backup of the seed phrase. And Bitbox made the perfect solution to back up your seed phrase. They made a reusable steel wallet. Check out that beauty. It's durable and extremely heavy. If I put it on the desk, I seriously fear for my own table. It's so, so heavy and durable. I love it. This is where my seed phrase is secure. Go to bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you use code Robin, you even get 5% off of your complete order. And the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual. You have to have the most secure self-custody setup. You have to secure your own devices. You have to protect your privacy. You have to set up an inheritance plan. And depending on where you live, you even want to have a plan B, a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really, really wrong. And through all those steps, the Bitcoin way is is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a and perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. And Coin Vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing Genesis edition of their watch collections. You have the date of the first ever mined Bitcoin block in there. And of course, also the block height and which epoch we are currently in. I love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece. And make sure to check out those amazing Coin Vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions. I love those watches so, so much. Yeah, that that makes it um, so hard to orange build because uh, you, you you know all those things and you know this 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 euro thing is not gonna be sustainable. 
Um, but then you have like your brothers, your sisters, your your aunts, your uncles, your your mom, dad, and all 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 the rest of it. They're like, oh yeah, I I don't want to be in Bitcoin because it's too risky for me, and they have all their money in euro, and you're like. Oh, I could not sleep like that. So I think that's that's where the, the missionary things and the, I want to orange pill them because I want to save them comes out. Yes. It's, it's it's hard to yeah. overcome that and be relaxed and like, okay, I will show them uh, that, that Bitcoin uh, is better over time with me uh, living a happy and great life. Uh, and then they, they might come. Um, it, it helps uh, definitely in, in my case to be really vocal about it on social media. So I don't have to be vocal in my physical life about it. So people that are interested in Bitcoin come automatically to me without me <laughs> bringing the topic up. Uh, but it, it's a, I remember the first few one, two years, it was really hard for me to not scream Bitcoin at every Bitcoin convers okay. any conversation. I think it's when you've understood it yourself, when you first understood it yourself, you just think, oh, gosh, this is wonderful. This is the panacea of all our evils. And you want to shout it from the rooftops. And I think once you've been doing it for a couple of years, you realize that that strategy is, is not the best strategy. And I mean, let's face it, Robin, you don't need much Bitcoin. There's 21 million or there's going to be slightly less than 21 million and there's 8 billion people on this earth. How much Bitcoin do you need to make a difference to your life? And we'll be able to, we'll, if what we think comes to be, we can help our families. So, so it, it's fine. You can relax about that. They, they will be fine. It's the families where there isn't a Bitcoin in the family uh, that will maybe suffer more. But, you know, I also have a very strong feeling, which is why I do, which is why I do Terahash and, and Ibia. I love Europe. I mean, I was born in the UK um, and then I met a German at university. And uh, as is often the case with the women, ran after, after him. He was, he was a German. And that's where we started this odyssey all around the world. It was mostly with, with his work that we were sent to all these different countries. And because I've lived in so many different countries... I know how wonderful it is in Europe. You know, I I can I don't have a fence, I don't have a gate. Um, this these things are changing. I don't want it to change. I want it to stay the way it is or, or improve, and that depends on us. We are the people. We are the people, and it's up to us to take a stand and stand up and go. I'm not doing that. That's wrong. I want to go on this path. And if we all disappear, then we then the ship is going to go down even far, further, far, faster. I mean, don't get me wrong. I will not go down with the ship. So if, if I ever get the feeling that, you know, if they want to try and take my Bitcoin away from me, I'm gone. I'm, I'm not going down with the ship, but I will do everything I can to turn the ship around in my very, very limited capacity. But, you know, it's amazing what a small group of people can achieve. A small group of very determined people can achieve great things. And, and if you look at the majority of the world, they're, they're sheep. They're not thinking at all. They're just not thinking at all. They're not noticing what's, what's going on. They're living in their day-to-day -day life full of consumerism and thinking, okay, that's going to make me happy and that's going to make me happy. And that's none of that's going to make you happy. You don't need much to make you happy, but you need the right things to make you happy. And we haven't got that in Europe. I mean, one of my absolute children, women are not having children anymore. They're just not, look at the birth rates. Why? So I, I've got a university degree, but I took a quarter of a century off to bring my children up because they're my most important asset. Why would I want to give birth to my most precious, precious thing and give it into the hands of somebody else to bring up with their values and their... But I was in a very privileged position that I could afford to stay home with my children. And the majority of women nowadays you need to have two incomes. Society tells you all the time being a mother is not worthy. I hate the expression working mother. I have never worked so hard in my life as when I was bringing up my children. And I find it a complete insult when people talk about working mothers. 
Mothering is a full-time job, but it's not recognized by society. You don't earn any money doing it. You're looked down on. <laughs> it was really funny when I had my four little children and we just built a new house here in Germany and I go along to a shop to buy a new kitchen and I had to fill out this form. And one of the, four, one of the questions was, what's your job? And I hate the phrase, uh, the phrase housewife, hausfrau in German. And so I always, I'm not interested in my house, but I'm interested in my children. So I wrote mother. And then the, the guy selling me the kitchen said, are you just a mother? And I said, are you just a kitchen seller? You know, and, and it's this, he didn't mean any harm by it, but it's the perception. When I, I would go to... I would go, you know, my, my husband was CEO and on the board and I've been to events meeting Angela Merkel and all this kind of stuff. So I've, I've done all that. And it, when you talk to the people and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a mother, they ignore you. You are no longer interesting for their conversation. And this is what has got to change. If we do not produce the next generation, it is the most valuable job that anybody can do to produce the next generation and to bring them up in a way that makes valuable valuable human beings, if we're putting such a low price on this, we are doomed as a society. If you look at all of the jobs that women with their natural feminine, and I know it's always a bell curve and you're going to have some women who've got more masculine traits and you're going to have some men who've got feminine traits, but on the whole, women are interested in people and men are interested in things. And all of the jobs that women are good at, which is all to do with nurturing, whether it's in the kindergarten, teaching, nursing, whatever, they're the worst paid jobs. And the jobs that are what men are good at, which is engineering and what, which are very valuable, I'm not saying they're valuable, they're the best paid jobs. And we're making a complete mistake there with the society. Women are fantastic and they're very different to men. Men are fantastic and they're very different to women. And if we have both of them working together, we will have the best society that you can hope to get. But what women try to do nowadays is they try and behave like men. So if I want to get ahead in my job, I have to put my elbows out and say, look at me, look at me, look at me. Aren't I brilliant? Aren't I number one? Aren't I strong? And this is not in my nature. My nature is to bring people together and, and nurture and, you know, like build and, and, and grow. And I think this is a mistake that women made. They try to be more like men in order to be successful. But what we should be saying is, wait a minute, I'm who I am. And I'm good as I am. Don't empower me. I hate the word empowering women. We don't need to be empowered. We are fine as we are. But what we need is that society recognizes the qualities that a woman brings to the table are equally as valuable as the qualities that a man brings to the table. And then I think we, there's no stopping us. Humans are wonderful and we can achieve the limit. Uh, we can achieve the sky. But recognize what each person brings to the table and and why is it that the money all flows to to the men in society is not good they're the ones who start the wars and they're more aggressive and and you know is that a good thing and this is why i started les femmes orange because the same thing is going to happen with bitcoin Women here, finance, technology, oh, oh, I'm not interested in finance and technology, so Bitcoin's nothing for me. And so 98% of Bitcoin at the moment, and I'm making that figure up because I haven't got a clue, but it must be something like that, is in men's hands. You just need to go to a Bitcoin conference. It's usually men on the stage. It's usually men in the audience. That will not be a healthy society if women are thrown right back down to where we used to be with absolutely no finances to our names and completely dependent on, on, on the men in our lives, that's not healthy. Uh, and so that's why I spend a lot of my time and energy on trying to encourage women. You don't have to be, you don't have to be good at tech. You don't have to understand finances to use Bitcoin and to know that Bitcoin is going to be of use to you and your family and your children and whoever. Hmm. Sorry, that was very long. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there were some uh, amazing snippets in there. I, I loved it a lot. And I think that, that this was an uh, extremely great, like, I, I loved it a lot. 
And the one thing that I think a lot of people actually don't get that the birth rate is uh, a threat to, to humanity right now. It's it's like the birth rate is not looking good. We, we're getting more people because we live longer, but we're not producing enough uh, new people. If, if if that continues like that, we will uh, extinct at some point. We will uh, be extinct. And look at the nations who are producing children. You know, so so if we want our values and our culture to to continue we need to be producing and i like the european way of life you know i've lived in i've lived in in dubai um where where the women wear the abaya and the i don't want to live like that i think you know and but i mean they're welcome to do whatever they want to but i don't want to live like that and so we need to make sure that if we think that our our culture and our value is is precious, and I do, then we need to make sure that we're bringing up the next generation. And I have no problem. Hey, listen, I married a foreigner. My daughter's getting married to a Russian in in six weeks. I've the more we get together, marry together, the better. Um, but you know, it's like take the situation that we've got in in Germany at the moment with the with the immigrants that came in. What did we do? We took all these people in, we dumped them in containers, normally next to the rubbish dump, which is if you go to any village, wherever you find the recycling uh, of that village, you'll find the container where all the uh, immigrants are stuck into, um, getting angrier and angrier because it's mainly young men. And I've got three young men myself. And I know if I was to stick them into a container for months and years at a time, they would become very frustrated. I mean, I've actually got one who lives in my house with me, Mohammed. Um, and, and that's what you need to do, that they that they they get to know who you are and they get to know what your values are. And if you want to come and live in Germany, um, you're very welcome. But these are the rules that we play by. This is the language that you need to learn. And, and, and this is what we expect of you to be a, a you know a, a, a desirable member of, of German society. We didn't do that at all, and then we're surprised when when problems happen. So I have no problem with um, you know I mean I'm an English person living in Germany. I am now German. I'm really proud of the fact that uh, that I've taken on the German citizenship. I'm probably more uh, patriotic than your your average average german I'm, I'm i'm humbled that another country was prepared to give me their their citizenship but i think that the the western values are really important and we are losing them freedom of speech we we're, we're losing we're losing all of this so we need to we need to fight for it I have a theory with, with Bitcoin, 100%, and you can shoot me. Satoshi Nakamoto is a man. Obviously, it's a man. This is somebody who could be very focused, who's worked and worked and worked and worked, and obviously on the shoulder of all those fantastic people who came before. But if you look at who are the core developers of Bitcoin, it's 90% men. This is what men do really, really well. They, they get a problem and they can solve that problem. Thank God for the men in our lives. When it comes to Bitcoin adoption, this is where I think we need the women because the women are the nurturers of society. So take Bitcoin as if it's a child. Now that it's up to the women, it's time for the women to step up and make this child, this wonderful child, ready for society. We need products that the society can use, that it's not as complicated you know, as it is. And this is where I see women now playing a big role in the adoption of Bitcoin. Yeah, you said that before to me in the recording, and I, I really like that, that you see um, women now as a key to the Bitcoin adoption uh, going forward. And I think that's a great point because uh, men are good in making something work and, and women are making something work really nicely. And also like it looks nice, like the UI design, if we stay in the app design, like men are doing the, the things that, okay, it, it gives the money from A to B, but how does the UI look? How does the, the interface yeah. look? And that's missing in Bitcoin. A lot of people are like, oh, that hardware wallet, uh, the sign if you make, uh, open up like a Sparrow wallet, it's like, oh, <laughs> what do I do here? Uh, it's, it's, like, it's like even for me in the beginning, it was like really like, oh, I, yeah, I have to watch now five, 10 YouTube videos to even know where the buttons right, are. Yeah. And, and I'm really afraid to, to press anything. So um, and it's we, not we need gonna that. Happen, Robin. It's not going to happen. Technical people do not understand how non-technical, non-technical people are. And so my very first, when I understood what Bitcoin was, I thought, oh gosh, I've got to bit some, I've got to meet some more Bitcoiners. 
And so the very first conference I went to was the Zitadella in Switzerland. And I don't know if you know the Zitadella. So it meets one year in Switzerland, one year in Austria, one year in Germany. And it's hardcore. And so there's me, this little gray old, gray-haired old lady. I turn up in Switzerland and I walk in there and, and it's all young developers. And, and I thought, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? I had the best weekend of my life, honestly. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're friendly and, and, and they're welcoming, wonderful. But when I'm looking at the presentations... And they're, you know, they're talking all the, it's, it's a foreign language to me. And they say, oh, you just need to go blah, 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 blah. And everything that they blah, 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 I haven't got a clue what they're talking about. It's not going to happen. And so when we do Les Femmes en Mange events, we had our first one two years ago, we got 70% women attending. And what we do is, you know, we do workshops to really show them how to do it. Let's all sit around with our computers. Let's all sit around with our bit, bit box. Let's all sit around. Let's, let's get some Satoshi. Let's send some lightning to each other. Hey, that was easy, wasn't it? You don't have to understand anything about the lightning network, but you can use it. You don't understand anything about the engine of your car, but you can use it. You don't understand how your credit card works, but you can use it. So if you can teach them the basic rules of what they need to be safe, and you do need to learn basic rules with Bitcoin, how to look after your keys and, and, and all the rest of it, that's very important. But you do not have to understand how it works beneath the bonnet. And once people understand that, that you need to know how to use it safely, then you'll find that they're much more prepared. And if you've got somebody up on the stage who's just talking tech, 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 you will lose And them. even a, a big part of the male audience, I, I know in the beginning, I was like, what is that five minutes I was turning off? Like, it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> if, if it's too much, like, if we hear uh, five words we don't understand, we, we tend to, like, look at something different. So I, I really like to, to bring something um, uh, easier to understand to Bitcoin. One topic that we uh, discussed a little bit in the beginning that I want to get into uh, is the adoption, uh, Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin adoption in Europe versus in the USA. I have an English podcast, so a lot of my guests are from the USA. I know my audience is 50% from the USA and only 22% from the European Union plus the UK. Uh, so I know they are skewed towards the USA because yeah, in, in Europe we have all those different languages and they in, in German they prefer German things and stuff like that. And when I talk to people, I have always this feeling like all the Bitcoin adoption on a political level is always like, oh, Trump is making a Bitcoin transaction. Kamala is doing this. I like. No, he's not. He didn't touch that <laughs> phone. He hasn't got a clue. <laughs> but, but, but that's what we, well, that's what we hear, right? Like that, that's yeah. all the things uh, that we hear. And uh, when I look at the political stage in Europe, it, it seems quieter. Is that, is that just like perception? Uh, or do you do you think that uh, America or the United States of America is further ahead uh, on the political level of what uh, Bitcoin adoption is going, or is Europe is, is Europe lagging in this in this regard? Yes, Europe is lagging because there was a wonderful case. Uh, there was a wonderful thing on LinkedIn that I saw yesterday that said America innovates, China rep replicates. Europe regulates. And uh, that's really, very true. So you'd, I lived in America for a while. And, and what's wonderful about the American people is they view every failure as a success. You know, so you, you just get on there, you try it. And if you fail, you're not a loser. You're a winner because you're, you're trying. And I think it's a different perception in, in Europe. If you tell people that you've had a business which has gone under, they think you're a loser. They'd rather not have a business at all. They'd rather work for the government and, and, and safely get their money. So, yes, America is definitely further ahead than we are in Europe. However, there is a lot going on behind the scenes or not even behind the scenes. I mean, we have the wonderful German politician, Joanna Kotta, who started the initiative Bitcoin in Bundestag. Um, and I was privileged enough to be the part of the first party to go to there. So, um The CEO of TerraHash, the company I work for, Chris Klager, was talking there along with Warman Ria. And were there many politicians sitting in the circle? No. Um, but was it an amazing thing to have a great big Bitcoin logo? And we took a Bitcoin miner. So there's been a Bitcoin miner in the German parliament. We had it specially sent over and, uh, and made just for that occasion. Um, so politically, we're slow or we're slower. But 
what I love, I mean, you just need to look to Germany. I love, I love Germany and I love the Germans. They, they're engineers. The Germans are engineers. And if you look at what's going on in Lightning, what, what's happening with, with, there's so much going on in Germany. Where are all the nodes? You know, a lot of the nodes are in Germany. So I think we're not as loud. I mean, the Americans like to be quite loud about things and, and shout things out from the stage. But I feel that there's a lot going on particularly in the German-speaking world. I can't speak so much to the rest of Europe. Um, we work together with, with people from Holland. I don't see an awful lot going on in France, but I might be wrong on that. I do see what's going on in England. Politically, it's a disaster. We work together with the UK policy. Um, the people who are trying to do the same thing as EBIA, yes, we're further behind than America, definitely. However, it's not all doom and gloom. There's more going on than you think. And the way that politics works in Europe is behind closed doors. And you need to you need to be talking to the right people. And it takes time to get to the right people. It's all about building trust, um, speaking the right language, uh, you know, that you, you use the words that they're used to hearing, not going in there like a bull in the china shop with, with your Bitcoin um apparel on, on your hat and telling them that they're all useless and they're all corrupt, that's not going to get you anywhere. Chip away, little bit, little bit, little bit. And, and you know, no, of course Bitcoin doesn't need Europe. Of course Bitcoin doesn't need Europe. But Europe does need Bitcoin. And this is what we've slowly got to get into their heads. And, you know, one one little meeting, one little talk with 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 serious companies. I mean, this is where TerraHash plays a massive role because We've been around for, for 75 years. We were built just after the Second World War. It was started off in the garage. You know how these stories always happen, and it's grown. We've now got 300 employees. We've got works in Neuss. We've got works in the, in the east of Germany. Now, when a company like that talks about the benefit of, of Bitcoin mining, the local politicians, obviously not the national politicians, because we're not yet Uniper or Siemens or whatever, but we're getting there. We're, we're getting there with those companies. So the more we can get the companies to understand how vital Bitcoin mining is, if you then get the, the likes of Uniper and Siemens and all of these big companies, them going along to the politicians and saying, we need this this is the regulation, this is how the regulation needs to be, then we've won. Then we've won. But a, a Bitcoin company who's a, a startup, they're not going to have, even though they're fantastic, I'm not dismissing them, they're fantastic, they're the future, but they're not going to be the ones to persuade politicians that they need to be listened to. It has to be the, has to be the, uh, the really big taxpayers, <laughs> big companies, yeah. Uh, that's well, a... they're not the taxpayers, though, are they? That's the, that's the thing that really annoys me. The larger the company, the less tax they pay. It's actually your mid-sized companies that we're the idiots. We're the ones who pay tax. You know, your big companies aren't paying tax. But anyway, that's a that's a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are closing down on the one hour mark. We let's not, let's not open this, this topic. Now. Um, really cool. Uh, as as we are now on the end of the podcast, uh, I have one more question because I think you have a unique perspective on that. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, orange pilling. When someone actually comes to you and, and asks you, okay, what, what what is Bitcoin? And, and he he or she is a, a no corner, especially maybe also someone takes uh, someone to a Les Femme Orange event and she knows nothing about uh, Bitcoin. How do you compare Bitcoin? There are so many interesting comparisons that people make with Bitcoin to actually make it understandable because if you have no clue what Bitcoin is, it's kind of hard to explain because there's nothing to really compare it to. Uh, how do you make uh, Bitcoin understandable and comparable? What works with women and what works with the whole world is storytelling. Tell your story and tell them what, what Bitcoin is for you. We've got a wonderful film out with Les Femmes Orange where um, Soilify, which is a regenerative um, agriculture platform, they were there and they did this wonderful film and they basically just went around. And we do have men coming to Les Femmes Orange, by the way. And there's a, there are men who love it because it's a much more collaborative atmosphere. It's a much more gentle atmosphere. And you'll find the men at the end saying, oh, that was wonderful. I could just be, you know, I don't have to be the cleverest in the room or whatever. And so they were going around and they were asking people, what's Bitcoin for you? And the majority of the answers were freedom, 
um, hope, optimism. So all these words that come out, this is what, you know, obviously it's a, it's a digital currency, but I mean, that's not going to get me excited. I don't, I don't understand what will I do, but you know, that doesn't get me excited. But if I listen to somebody and they're telling me about their life and I can relate to that life because it's a life similar to mine and I know that I go to work um, eight hours a day and, and I work my socks off and I'm getting poorer and poorer and I don't know how I'm going to cope when I go on to a pension. And those people are talking about a similar life and how they found this thing that they have, that has given them hope. That's all I need to know. That's all I need to know. And then I am motivated to find out for myself. And my one of my favorite books that I recommend in, in the German language is Die Orange Pille, which was written by um, Jeremy Mangold. And he's a literary critic for the Times. And I love the way he writes his book, you know, there's because he's exactly, well, he's, he's an extremely intelligent guy, but he's not a technical guy. And so he's written this book in a way of, I don't understand this. Why have I fallen so madly in love with Bitcoin? I'm not interested in money. I'm not interested in, in, in technology, yet I love this Bitcoin. And so that is a fantastic book. So you have to look at who you're talking to. If you're talking to somebody who is mathematical, financial, technical, then then yeah, give them the books that explain, you know, mastering Bitcoin, mastering lightning, get all those all those Andreas Antonopoulos books. And if it's somebody who's more like me, more of a social person. Give them the Alex Gladstein. Give them, you know, give give them the storytelling books of why Bitcoin is good, and that's, you know, they don't need to understand. It's, it's money, and then you first say, well, what's money? And then you realize that you don't understand what money is, and then you start. I mean, you know this, and you start questioning absolutely everything. But then they're on the journey by themselves, and you don't need to do anything because they'll, they'll find their way down one rabbit hole into the next rabbit hole. And it's really funny because you can just see us all, all of us on this most amazing journey. We're all on a most, we're all changing. More profound, 54. You wouldn't have thought you could change that much when you fear profound changes. And that's what every Bitcoin is on. Really, really good. How did you change? Uh, as I don't know you before Bitcoin, <laughs> how, 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 was, how was that training for you? I think I would say that my values haven't changed. I've always been very family oriented. I've always you know, loved nature, not spent enough time in nature. But what I've really changed is how I think solutions can happen. And, you know, I used to be very, I mean, I'm not saying that you don't need government and you don't need, you know, I think, I think it's, it's, you need rules. You need rules, definitely. I know that as a mother of a family, without rules, it, nothing happens. But the same rules have got to apply to every single member. So there was no, I couldn't say to my children, don't eat sweets. And then I stuff myself with sweets. They're not going to listen to me. And we've got the problem at the moment that the, the, the system that we've got, there's one rules for thee and there's another rule for me. And that's no good. That's no good. So, and that's the beauty of Bitcoin. It's rules without rulers, you know, so everybody has to stick to the same rules. So I, I've, I think that we need to get decent, more decentralized again. I think it's, I'm responsible for myself and I'm responsible for my children. No one's coming to save me. Nobody is coming to save me. So I need to make sure that I've got everything in place that I need and that my children need. Whereas before you think about, oh, well, you know, there's the pensions, there's the social welfare. I think this has all done us a lot of harm. I think that the health system has done us a lot of harm because you then you don't take responsibility for yourself and look after your own health. If you look at the obesity levels, you know, people get really fat And then they get a hip operation. Now, if they had to pay that hip operation by themselves, they would make damn sure that they don't get so fat. Or take the social services. If I hear the child screaming next door, screaming, 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 what do people do? They ring the, the social services and they say, there's a child screaming next door. What would be better? That I knock on the door and I say to that woman who's probably exhausted and over-challenged, Do you want me to take your child for an hour, two hours? Can I bring you a meal? Can I help you? And so with this whole social state, we have stopped relying on our own families and on our neighbors and on our neighborhood and on our society. And we rely on these bureaucrats 
sitting somewhere miles away from us who've got no idea what's going on in our life. And so what, what I believe is we have to get back to the small. And I, as a, you know, the families need to decide what's right for the families and the neighbours need to decide what's right for the neighbours. And, and that's where you need the rules and regulations in place for small areas. You know, you can't be having people deciding hundreds of kilometres away to take the pandemic. You know, the pandemic was a massive eye opener for me. And I was I was a very, very um, following all the rules at the beginning and thinking, oh, this is what I need to do until I saw how ridiculous the rules were. And that happened because... <laughs> I was going to pick up my son-in-law from the airport. He was flying in from London to Munich. So I go to the airport to pick him up and I'm waiting outside and all of the Germans come out and they greet their families, they cuddle their families and off they go. And there's no, no max, no max, no max. And when I finally work out what's happened, they've kept all of the foreigners and they kept them overnight under police surveillance at the airport, sleeping on camp beds until the next morning when they could be tested. And then if they were negative, they could go out. And I thought, but it's a virus and you've just let all those Germans into the country and the virus doesn't know whether I'm German or Russian. And then it was just for me, that was just a, this is a load of bollocks. You know, they've got no idea, excuse my language. They've got no idea what they're doing. It's just these rules all over the place. Maybe they mean well with them. I don't know. I don't want to comment on that. But whatever it is, they're stupid rules. And so I need to set the rules that are sensible for my for my environment. Don't tell me I can have five people at Christmas when I've got four children. Yeah, I will decide that I can have all of my children sitting around the table. And so this is this is we need far less rules. And this is another thing I learned as a mum. Don't have many rules. But the rules that you have, people have to stick to them. And then, you know, then and you feel the consequences. You don't get punished if you don't stick to the rules, but you feel the consequences of you not sticking to the rules. What we've got at the moment is there's no accountability. It doesn't matter what what decisions are made at a political level. Nobody has to take a accountability for the decisions that they make they just leave at the end of their four year and then they go and get enormously well-paid speaking events and it doesn't matter what they've left behind them this has got to stop we need people who are making decisions have to take accountability for the decisions that they make and then I'm all for leaders you can be my leader if if you really you're out the front if you want to have a war You send your children into that war. You send your children first, and then I might consider sending my children afterwards. But don't send my children to war when you're not going to war. You know, this is how this is how I've changed. That that's beautiful. That's a that's a beautiful segment. Thank you so much for that. Um, We have end routine. uh, The first end routine question is always the same question for every guest, Uh, and uh, the question is, what can we learn from you besides uh, Bitcoin and all the things that we already talked about? Something about myself. Yeah, whatever you want to to, to share, uh, uh, either a learning or something about yourself, or uh, I, I leave it open open to you how you want to answer that. I think it's important to remember Bitcoin's not everything, and you've got one life and live that life, and a life without love is a pointless a pointless life. You know, you need you need a roof over your head, you need something to eat, you need something to drink, and you need love. And we're all so busy running around, running around trying to find solutions, but I might be dead tomorrow. And so I want to make sure that I have got those things in my life and they will be always more important to me than... I love that a lot. Really cool. Um, We have an end routine in the uh, podcast where the previous guest is asking also a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is. Uh, This is a a short one, I guess. (laughs) Did you already create or visited a local Bitcoin meetup where you uh, live? (laughs) <laughs> yes, of course. I, I, my first. We've got in Munich. We don't have an Einen Zwanzig Stammtisch, but we've got a similar Stammtisch, and I, I used to go along to that. Now we have two Les Femmes Orange uh, meetups in Munich. So there's one in Parsing and there's one in the Kaffee. Les Femmes Orange is growing. We're getting, we're getting, and we're modelled on Einen Zwanzig. I love Einen Zwanzig. I think they're fantastic, um, and so we've actually created our own meetups because people want to meet up with with like-minded people and you know I used to love going to those those Stammtisch with Einen Swansig but the man next to me would be showing me his latest hardware wallet or something and I would 
Oh. <laughs> and you know it's fine it's interesting for him it's not interesting for me and what interests me doesn't interest him it's fine but that's the way it is so yes I go to I go to as much as I can um but of course now because it's my full life you know I'm I live and breathe bitcoin in all my I'm going less and less it's it's too exhausting and I've got four children and they they need their mum as even though they're adult they need their mum Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, I, I can understand that. I was, I'm living in since four months in Vienna and I got to one, uh, 21, uh, 21 uh, Stammtisch till now. I hope I can get to more, but it's, uh, if you, if you work ho whole, uh, whole day in Bitcoin, it's like, oh yeah, at seven, eight in the night, maybe I can do something else. <laughs> yeah. and, and to be honest, I mean, if you look at Terahash, we're a very small team and we're all extremely passionate about what we do because we're obviously we work it. It's not a job. It's, it's, a, it's a vocation. And I mean, we're often still working at that time at night. Our chat is going mad with, you know, so yeah, there's, uh, there's not that much time left. And then you just need, you just need a break. Uh, really cool. And now you're going to ask me for a question for... Oh, oh! Uh, I, I usually do it offline, but if you already have one, uh, you can give it to me. Uh, also now. One. What have you done for yourself today to make you a better person for tomorrow? That's beautiful. I would in, uh, I would answer uh, interviewed Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really nice. Oh, I like that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Robin. Uh, also, thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for being on. Before I let you go, uh, where can people find you, reach out to you, uh, ask you questions? So we have our uh, webs uh, website, terahash.space, uh, ebea.work, E-B-E-A dot work, lesfemmesorange.work. So those are the three websites. I'm on Twitter. I hate social media. I really hate social media. I am on Twitter under Gaia underscore Rachel. Uh, but I try and do as little social media as, as I can because life is too short to scroll. And I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. Really, really cool. Thank you so much, Rachel, for being on my show today. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.